We told you first, and it is now official, American Tower Corporation buys 51% stake in Biome as Shrey Infra and the Tatas exit the company. ATC will now have over 50,000 towers in India, post this 14,000 crore rupee deal. HDFC Bank delivers yet again. Profits grow over 20% for the ninth straight quarter as the quality also remains stable. Wipro estimates meet... Ripro meets the street in Q2. Dollar revenues are on target. The company's guidance for the third quarter is muted. Bajaj Auto be beats estimates in the second quarter. Low commodity prices boost margins. High realizations take profits higher by 58%. Do you, in hindsight, regret that decision? No, not at all. Actually, um, you know, we pay dividends with a lot of pride. Indigo's Aditya Ghosh defends the company's dividend policy, says net worth has turned positive, promises costs will go down even further, and asserts that Indigo does not need the crutches of foreign investment. Hard drive maker Western Digital acquires Candice for $19 billion. The deal gives Western Digital a foothold in the mobile data storage industry. Reliance Capital is set to buy the asset management business of Goldman Sachs in India. Anil Ambani's company will shell out over 240 crore rupees in an all-cash deal. Government meets PSU bankers and ramps up risk management after a slew of forex scams. Minister of State for Finance Jayant Sinha says the system is not under threat. Nestle moves faster to resurrect Maggie. Sources say the company resumes flour procurement from mills. The India head travels to Switzerland to fine-tune the comeback plan. That's an exclusive. Politicians make a beeline to Faridabad after two Dalit children were burnt to death. Rahul Gandhi blames the attitude of the Prime Minister and the Chief Minister for the murders. Chief Minister Khattar buckles under pressure and orders a CBI probe. To the brand is this intimate relationship between us and the customer base. We have 60% of the people that buy our cars every year are, re are returning customers. The unexplored potential of Ferraris in developing businesses that are adjacent to the car. Ferrari has made its debut on Wall Street and shares are surging as we speak. Just because we're a listed company, we will not try to push volumes. That is the categorical assertion coming in from the company's chairman who speaks exclusively to CNBC. Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour. Hi, Nandara. Hi, Shirin. Are you going to buy a Ferrari? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I can continue to dream on about buying a Ferrari, but uh, it's not going to happen, not in this lifetime anyway. But let's head straight to the market action. Consolidation continues to be the game on the last street. The market's ended with marginal losses, but that doesn't tell you the entire story. Shares in the Shanghai index posted their biggest fall in five weeks, down by over 3%, and that spooks the Nifty, which tumbled midday, but managed to recover and defend the 8,250 mark. Ditto for the Sensex, it lost about 20 points. Mid caps were bucking the trend for the last two days, but today they also ended with marginal losses. So that's the story on the last street for you. But on to the big deal of the day. We told you first, and it is now official, American Tower Company has signed an agreement to buy 51% stake in Viom for over 14,000 crore rupees. This includes the company's debt. Kritika joins us now to break up the details for us. Kritika, it is official today. Take us through the contours. Shireen, bang in line with what we had expected. expected. So, uh, straight up to the valuation, the cash consideration that ATC will be paying for that 51% stake is 7,635 crore rupees to be exact. Now, the debt component is 6,000... 500 crore rupees. So if you look at the equity value, that comes up to be almost 14,000 crore rupees. And then if you look at the enterprise value, that's about 20,333 crore rupees. Now, break this up for Shrey Infra, which will be exiting its entire 18.5% stake. Shrey Infra gets an additional 339 crore rupees, given that they ha they'll be relinquishing management control. So as we reported, they'll be getting a management premium and they're signing a non-compete. So all in all, the amount that Shrey Infra gets is about 3,000 crore rupees. 
SOP. So watch out for that stock tomorrow. Now, uh, what uh, uh, on the annual in that case is that ATC has signed a, uh, in the term sheet that they have the option of acquiring the additional 49% stake through a put and call option. Now, at a later date, there could be a merger on cards. There will be a merger by the end of next financial year. So. If I go into the detail, the current shareholding is Tata Group at 54%. That will be diluted to 34%. Uh, Shrey Infra will be exiting. GIC and Oman Investments uh, will be exiting. IDFCP will continue to hold 3% and Macquarie SPI Infra will continue to hold around 11% stake. Now, after the merger is completed, uh, uh, the remaining shareholders that hold about 49% stake will see their uh, equity being diluted to about 35 to 36% stake roughly, with Tata Group having about 26%. Macquarie Seven and IDFCP to uh, to two point five percent roughly. Now, what does this mean as a whole? There will be a combined uh, entity being created, obviously with a uh, almost fifty six thousand uh, towers and combined roughly bid of about uh, two thousand six hundred and seven crore rupees, uh, making them right in line after their uh, market leader, Bharti Infratel. Going forward, no layoffs, no major issues around the corner, but they are expecting the deal to be completed by the end of the financial year. Let's listen in to what the management of Wyom Infrastructure as well as Shrey Infrastructure which is exiting its management control and its shareholding had to say exclusively to us earlier. Enterprise value for the Kanoria block uh, Shrey group comes to approximately 22,200 crores uh, and equity value of about 16,400 crores. This will be the largest investment if you really see it's about seven and a half thousand crore of cash upfront now, plus a further uh, uh, option which the ATC has. That would uh, entail over two and a half billion dollar of uh, investments in the country. Over and above that, uh, uh, you have the debt. So gradually, if you see the overall transaction, is about three billion dollar, which is one of the largest uh, investment in FDI in the country uh, uh, since this new government has come in. Shareholders would only be Tata's, Mercury, and IDFC Fund Three. These are the only three players who will remain with their stake of this uh, 49%, which also post the merger of ATC business into the company uh, may come down uh, to about 30-35%. Uh, we will deliver a great year, uh, close the transaction, which should happen by the end of this financial year, and only then will the integration process start in the next financial year, potentially. Processes, uh, reporting, uh, you know, logs and everything, a lot of work will have to go in. The people integration part will obviously be critical in this as well. And that's the focus which will start post all the approvals come in. In fact, the Bahamas CEO also telling CNBC TV 18 we're a few quarters away from when a swap ratio is decided for continuing uh, shareholders that will stay invested. Well, here are the big earnings in the banking space that came out. HDFC Bank has reported a steady set of numbers for the second quarter with profit growth holding steady at 20%. That's for the ninth quarter in a row. CNBC TV 18's Ritter Singh gets you the fine print. The country's second largest private sector lender has delivered with its second quarter performance. Net profit grew 20.5%, helped by a 21% jump in net interest income and a 25% growth in other income. Provisions, however, gave pause, jumping 49% over last year, but the management waves away any concerns. The actual increases in provisions are primarily in the general provisions for standard assets because the loan growth has been you know, much stronger. Asset quality in terms of gross NPAs have remained you know, very stable, so clearly the increase in provisions has more to do with the general provisions and floating provisions than any deterioration in the asset quality. True to form, the bank has maintained healthy asset quality. Both gross and net NPAs fell marginally this quarter. Restructured loans stood at 0.1% of total advances at 4,185 crore rupees. However, margins slipped by a higher than expected 10 basis points to 4.2%, but again, the management is not too perturbed. One, the, uh, the drop in base rate which you rightly referred to. The other, of course, is that we have seen this extremely strong increase in uh, fixed deposits. Both of these have taken a few basis points each of the NIMS, but we still remain in our range of 4.1 to 4.4. Be that as it may, there's no denying that these are trying times for the lender. While its battle to maintain high growth rates is ongoing, the bank also has to deal with being caught up in the 6,000 crore rupee Bank of Baroda money laundering scam.
Again, the management counters this worry as well, saying it has a robust system in place to deal with such one-off incidents. In Mumbai, Ritu Singh. More earnings is boy. It has been a busy day. IT major Wipro met expectations with the second quarter numbers. Dollar revenues rose by 2%, which was in line with the poll. But what bothered the street was the company's guidance for the third quarter. Wipro growth guidance of 0.5 to 2.5% is below the industry average. The company blames furloughs and less working days for the weak guidance. Shri. Well, that's right. And the Wipro management will be joining us live on India Business Hour Plus in just a short while from now. So stay tuned to find out more about Wipro's quarter gone by as well as the road ahead. Now another company that posted a good set of numbers in Q2 is Vajaj Auto. On account of the fall in commodity prices as well as the change in the portfolio mix, it's taken the margins higher than 21%. Sonia joins us now with a complete breakup of the numbers. Sonia, the markets have given the Bajaj Auto numbers a thumbs up. Well, thanks for that. It was a good quarter for Bajaj Auto and it ended up being the biggest gainer on the index today. The margins were the big surprise this time around. On account of lower commodity prices, margins went up 180 basis points year on year, coming in at 21.6%. Also, the overall realizations for the company have gone up by 2% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, coming in at 57,710 rupees a unit. The gross margins have also gone up. That's because of the fall that we've seen in raw material prices. But not just that, the export realizations have improved because of the way the rupee has depreciated. So lots of things working in favor of Bajaj Auto. Revenues were up about 2.2 percent and profits went up almost 58 odd percent. Uh, the export realizations for the company have come in at 65.2 rupees uh, to the dollar versus about 63.9 that they realized last quarter. So all in all, good set of numbers for the company. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Sonia, for joining us with that analysis of Bajaj Auto having a good quarter. Here's another counter that had a good second quarter. Idea Cellular reported second quarter numbers that met expectations. The street had been expecting muted numbers. Idea's profit slipped 13.1%. Both voice and data realizations were under pressure. Idea's revenue too slipped 1.2%. During the quarter, the EBITDA saw a slip by over 5%. The EBITDA margin was at 35.2%. We are now reporting on a um, uh, year-on-year -year basis in margin improvement of 2.4%, standalone margin is 32% and on a consolidated basis our margin is ahead of 35%. Uh, we, uh, we've seen uh, our margin improving in the last two years and if the, we continue with the growth story and can continue to be able to improve uh, utilization and continue to get the benefit of scale, uh, we remain uh, optimistic of uh, continuing this story of uh, margin improvement and uh, faster uh, a bit of growth over revenue. Well, that's Himanshu Kapania there of Idea Cellular. On to JSW Steel, which managed to deliver better margins than expected despite the challenging environment. The steel major has actually managed to post a net profit figure of 117 crores, and that's thanks to lower depreciation and a close to 50% rise in other income. The sales volume also grew a modest 4% in the second quarter. JW Steel, that way, volume-wise, production is 3.25 million ton, slightly lower than year-on-year -year or quarter-on-quarter. -quarter. Mm. We have taken a shutdown of one of the blast furnaces at Vijayanagar mm. <clears throat> for 105 days on 19th of August. So for 43 days, there was no production from, from one of the furnaces. That's why we find uh, the production, crude steel production, was lower by 1%. Similarly, if we look at volume of sales, it is the highest ever uh, volume of sales by JW Steel. We have done 3.189 million tons in this quarter. So that is 4% higher than the corresponding quarter of last year. Well, a slew of earnings today and not a bad day as far as the corporate calendar was concerned. But moving on now, every search engine is not Google and every airline is not Indigo. That was the word coming in from Indigo's Aditya Ghosh when I asked him about the company's 25,000 crore rupee valuation. Speaking to me earlier today, Ghosh said that Indigo has no regrets about the dividend payout and the company's net worth is now positive. Not just that, he also promised that costs will go down even further. Listen in to that exclusive chat. We pay dividends with a lot of pride. Uh, we have paid 3,500 crores of dividends over the last four years. In these last four years, there was also a year, 2012, when we made a profit of 150 crores, 140 crores I think it was. We generated close to 900 crores of cash. And even as a private company, mm. we did not pay out a dividend. So our view on dividends on cash is that we are profitable, mm. we are cash generating, 
every year we'll sit down and see what's our cash requirement, what's what's happening with the competition, and the surplus cash we've dividended out. Because it's our strongly held view that airlines, or for that matter, any organization is owned by the shareholders. Shareholders put in money for a return, and there's, we as a management There's no team, argument with that. There's no argument and with that. even on that net, negative net, net worth thing, um, on that particular day, on the June 30th, 30th, or it's 30th yeah. of June, yeah. technically and, and temporarily, the net worth goes down to by 139 crores. From 1st of July, the cash starts building up again, and the ne negative net worth becomes positive. Mm. And two more facts. On that 30th of June, we had 3,600 crores of cash in our books, mm. and 140 crores is 20 days worth of profitability for Indigo. Mm. We are now three and a half months away. Mm. Uh, so, you know, it's a non-event for us. You, I know you've said this in the past yeah. as well over the last couple of days that this is a non-event. But you've also said that you don't intend putting in an official dividend policy. policy Why is that? The reason for Because that it would give people more clarity. Do you intend to continue to give our dividends in the manner in which you have? Uh, why wouldn't you provide clarity to the markets now that you will be a listed entity? Yeah, yeah so Shirin, we are actually focused on running a profitable, sustainably profitable business. While in the past, most years we've paid out a dividend, as I said, there was a year then we, where we did not, and we took this very pragmatic view. Even going forward, if we say that we're going to pay out a dividend every year, then it will limit us from taking decisions which are in the best interest of the business like we did in 2012. Mm. So what we will do going forward, if the past predicts the future, that we'll be similarly shareholder focused, overwhelmingly shareholder focused, we hardly have any capex requirements, hmm. but we will always... Uh, help me understand that, because I've heard you say this twice yes. now, that you hardly have any capex requirements. You're ordering 430 yeah. aircraft. Uh, another risk factor that you talk about in your uh, prospectus is that you may incur a significant amount of debt in order for you to be able to acquire the 430 order that uh, you've placed uh, with Airbus. So uh, help us understand what the debt position is going to be, and then you say that you will not require cash. So you know when lawyers write risk factors, Yes. We take the most conservative view. Uh, I've been a lawyer in the past. <laughs> um, so there is no capex requirements really because all most of our planes overwhelmingly are on, are on operating leases. Mm. Our capex requirement is what? IT expense, some ground services equipment. Our total capex requirement is about 40, 50 crores a year mm -hmm. other than aircraft. For aircraft, we are doing operating leases. 40, 50 crores versus the 10, 11,000 crores of, of our total operating cost. So you it, don't see it, that going up significantly? No, we don't, because for the next foreseeable future, for the next five, six, seven years, we will again do primarily operating leases. So we actually don't see debt going up. We've had this conversation for several years, and every time I asked you, are you looking at an IPO? And you said, no, we don't need the to. We don't, so. we don't need the cash. <laughs> we're not in talks. We're not looking at that possibility. So, you know, we were joking about this in office, and they said Rahul Gandhi is a reluctant politician, and Indigo is a reluctant <laughs> IPO. So uh, why? And, and I heard you say in Bombay the other day that the decision to do an IPO is for legitimacy. What does that mean exactly? So, you know, for the last seven years, we have been saying we make money and people will be like, no, no, can't be. Last seven years we've been saying we have the lowest cost structure in the world. People would say there is no low cost in India. Last seven years we say that, you know, we, we do the most conservative accounting. No, 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 no must put something on. Now, with a 600 page IP, uh, you know, prospectus, uh, it is, people have gone through it page by page and they can't find a single hole, hole in so that. So you don't care about PLF, you don't care about market share, but you care about what people think of you. I, I think so. And the reason for that is, that is, it is important that, you know, when we are an airline of our size, the country's largest airline, people should feel that same confidence and should be, people should feel good about something that has happened in India. That's Aditya Ghosh explaining what he's calling a non-event as far as the network goes, uh, turning negative on June 30th. Let's head back to Deal Street. Now Reliance Asset Management Company has just made its first acquisition, acquiring financial giant Goldman Sachs India Mutual Fund business in an all-cash deal. Reliance Capital will be shelling out 243 crore rupees to acquire the entire asset management division, whose total current assets under management stand at more than 1,700 crore rupees. It also marks the fourth high-profile exit of a global financial conglomerate from the Indian mutual fund industry in recent times. CNBC TV 18 Sajid Mangat caught up with the president and CEO of Reliance Asset Management and began that conversation by asking him about the rationale for this transaction.
if you were to look at it, the benchmark and gold band, uh, they were the largest in ETF and we were the second largest. This gives us a strong position. But I think broadly at this point of time, ETF in India is very small relatively. Mm -hmm. But we believe going forward, the way it's been happening across the globe, ETFs will become big and a lot of institutional investors, HNI investors have been look, investing in ETF. So going forward, we expect ETF to become much bigger than what it is today. And that's why I said this is a, start, a strategic investment from our point of view. Before this also, we have seen a lot of acquisitions have been happening in the industry and a lot of those proposals have come to us. But I think we gave them a miss, but this is something which we saw clearly fits into our overall long-term strategy. We will be getting all the uh, uh, key employees of the company and we will ensure that there is a smooth transition and the, from an investor's point of view, if you were to look at it, uh, we need to ensure that the investors benefit from the expertise. But when do you expect this entire uh, deal to be uh, complete? Yes, it's an uh, all-cash deal. Uh, it is all subject to regulatory approvals, so which should happen over the next three to four months. Mm -hmm. So broadly, we have to go and reach out to SEBI uh, mm -hmm. and CCI. And I think we expect I think, to get the regulatory approvals in this fiscal. Well, that's the deal back home, but on to the big international story. More consolidation in the chip-making industry. Hard drive maker Western Digital has acquired SanDisk for $19 billion. The deal will make Western Digital a major player in the mobile data storage business. But let's talk about the big listing on Wall Street, Nantara. Sai Shireen Ferrari has made his debut on Wall Street at opening. It listed at $60 as against the issue price of $52 this year. Shares are rising in opening trade and it plans to raise a billion dollars by selling 10% stake. This values Ferrari at a whopping $10 billion. The company's chairman told CNBC that the company is not building any car with Apple as is being rumored. This company was founded on one simple principle. You only produce one car less than the demand, the demand for the vehicle. You just don't exceed that equation. And so we need to grow the demand side before we try and supply it and it really destroy the exclusivity of the brand. It's a very careful, very careful walk and a very, very tight relationship between us and the dealer body. Well, that's Ferrari listing on Wall Street. FMCG giant Nestle is gearing up for the relaunch of Maggi noodles in India. CNBC TV 80 learns that Nestle has already resumed procurement of flour from mills for manufacturing the product. And we also understand that Nestle India's CEO is currently in Switzerland to try and work out the comeback plan with the global management. Priya joining us now with the exclusive story. Priya, what else do you have for us? Well, just a few days after three accredited laboratories given all clear to Nestle's Maggie Noodles, we learned that the company is gearing up to relaunch the brand in the market. In fact, what we're learning is that the company has already begun the procurement of flour uh, from mills. And in fact, initially, it's going to be about 100 to 200 tons. And that's a very small amount because remember, Nestle will be looking at manufacturing samples uh, to get them tested before they can actually roll out the product in the market. Uh, remember that Nestle used to actually procure about 1,500 to 1,800 tons of a flour in a day but in fact uh, this uh, procurement of 100 to 200 uh, tons is going to be uh, once or twice a week is what we are picking up. We are also learning that mills in uh, South India would be actually uh, supplying the flour to Nestle's Mysore as well as Goa facility. In fact we did reach out to Nestle on this and the company said uh, that they are uh, that they are engaging with authorities and restarting the manufacturing process uh, would require alignment with several stakeholders. Back to you. Thanks, Arpia, for joining us with that exclusive story. That's Nestle beginning the preparation to bring Maggi noodles back in the shelves. If yesterday was all about the foreign institutional investors, today was all about the big domestic market players. Finance Ministry officials, led by the Economic Affairs Secretary Shakti Kanta Das, hosted the big domestic fund houses to discuss ways of improving the existing primary market infrastructure. The government also sought feedback from the market players on how to incentivize and drive up participation in the corporate bond market. We understand that all of these players asked for uniform KYC norms and rationalization of taxation. Here's what the Economic Affairs Secretary Shakti Kanta Das had to say. The discussions mainly focused on uh, three themes. We talked about uh, the suggestions were made about the development of market infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Secondly, discussions also centered around uh, widening the investor base and uh, retail participation in the markets. And thirdly, we talked about and discussed about uh, depending of corporate uh, bond market mm. and also bigger and wider retail participation in the bond market. Mm. 
Well, it has been a busy day at the Finance Ministry. While the Finance Minister was busy reviewing the policy situation, his colleague Jayant Sinha was meeting public sector bank chiefs today to try and draw up a plan to deal with the various forex scams that have been tumbling out of the closet. North Block has urged banks to bring in more robust compliance policies in order to detect and prevent such fraud. Speaking to the media, right after that meeting, Sinha putting up a brave face saying there's nothing wrong with the Indian banking system and that the forex scams that have just been revealed do not pose a systemic risk. By and large, uh, because all of our banks already have uh, a very uh, high quality uh, systems in place, uh, we have uh, uh, significant uh, surveillance going on, significant uh, uh, analytical uh, analyses uh, of uh, uh, banking transactions. Uh, we felt uh, that uh, what had happened with Bank of Baroda uh, was not a systemic matter, it was a one-off matter. The forex scams are not a systemic threat. That's the words coming in from Giants. And he also said the NPA situation could continue for another two to three quarters. The government has largely been able to contain food prices this monsoon, but the one pressure point remains is the price of pulses. The finance minister Arun Jaitley today held a meeting to review the situation. And while the government's already imported 5,000 metric tons in a bid to bring the prices under control, the focus has now shifted on hoarding. 3,200 raids were conducted across the country, helping the government release an additional 36,000 metric tons into the market. Finance minister is confident the prices will now only head lower. Talking of importing, uh, we have imported 5,000 tons, 3,000 more tons is in the process uh, of landing. As this hoarded quantity gets into the market, along with what is being imported, in some wholesale markets already as a result of this raids, easing of some prices has begun. Well, that's the finance minister taking stock of the situation with regards to pulses. 5,000 metric tons already coming in as imports. But here's the big national story of the day. A day after two children were burnt alive in Haryana in a village, politicians have been making a beeline to Faridabad. Under pressure, the chief minister, Qatar, has ordered a CBI probe. Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi lashing out at Prime Minister Modi and the BJP for raising caste and communal issues in the country. Four people have been arrested in connection with the Faridabad caste violence. Three policemen have also been suspended. Meanwhile, the protesting villagers have blocked the Faridabad highway and will escalate their protest by blocking another highway. This is an attitude. This is an attitude shared by the Prime Minister and the Chief Minister of this state and the entire BJP and the RSS. The attitude is that if somebody is weak, he can be crushed. That is the attitude. This is what you are seeing is the result of this attitude. जो कुछ भी जो कुछ भी प्रकार की घटनाएं हो रही हैं बहुत ही दुर्भाग्यपूर्ण है बहुत ही निंदनीय है नहीं होनी चाहिए और संबंधित राज्य के मुख्यमंत्री से हमारी बातचीत हुई है Well, not the time to play politics, but that's exactly what's going on. But coming up next, what is the reason behind the muted guidance that's been given out by Vipro? We'll ask the management. They join us live on the other side of the break.